guest here, if you're a guest here, we're doing a thing called Scale Back Summer because one of our values, two of our values here are people matter uh, and create margin. And so we want to show our people that they matter and we want to help them create margin and have time to spend with family. So for the next, uh, I guess, like four more weeks, I think it is. It might be. Maybe it's three, but I think four weeks uh, or three. Uh, three weeks, we're still going to just be kind of scaled back. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah. But hey, welcome. My name is Brent. I'm the lead pastor here at Epic Life. If you're a first-time guest here, man, we want to say welcome home. We're so glad you're with us. I would love afterwards if you would come introduce yourself to me at Connecting Point. If you are new or a guest and you'll fill out a connection card, we're not going to stalk you or anything. But what we would love to give you is a, a t-shirt. Uh, also, if we have some left, we'll give you a free car wash, to a big league car wash. And then we also are going to make a $10 donation to Kids Club uh, for your deal. So it was awesome. Last week we had 10 cards came in and so people got shirts and hundred dollars goes out to kids club. And so, uh, which is a really cool thing. And so, um, but before we get started today, we're getting, we're kicking off a new series called limitless. That's what we'll be doing for the next four weeks. But before we get started, I just want to ask you a question. So by show of hands, so this is the audience participation to so get ready and get stretched. How many of you by show of hands, you like going to go see a movie? Anybody like to go to the movies that you like to go see a movie? Any, any brave people like go to the drive through yeah, I sometimes do, but man, we get mosquitoes and stuff. It's too hot. I'm like, man, I got to turn my AC on. This is crazy. Anybody like, I don't like the movies. I'm going to wait for it to come out so I can watch in my own house. Anybody that way? Yeah. Anybody at Netflix watchers? Anybody here? Yeah. I think all of us have done the Netflix binge. Um, uh, so our oldest, Eli, he's here. Uh, we introduced him to Stranger Things like uh, about two weeks. Yeah, two weeks ago. And man, he binge watched all three seasons like this boom, boom, boom. I was like, I've never seen him like put down video games like that. He was like, what are you doing? He's like, I just want, I can't stop watching. He's like, he's watching and it, it was a lot of fun. And so now my daughter, Mackenzie, she's kind of jumping in. Isaiah's like, I think I want to watch this too, but it's kind of creepy. But I love the show for so many reasons. One is it's set in the eighties and there's all kinds of funny stuff with that. But also I love it because so a lot of it, not a lot of it, but there was different parts of it that were, um, filmed in my hometown. So the arcade that you see in season two and three, that was where I took my dry cleaners. And so that was like, that was the dry cleaners. And so last summer we went, not this summer, but last summer we were in Georgia. And so we took the kids, they hadn't even watched it yet. And we're like taking photos in front of it for the arcade. It was like, this is awesome. They unfortunately had taken the sign down that said arcade, but I'm like, why did you not just leave it up? You're going to have to shoot, shoot season three. Um, but, uh, there was this one scene in town, and I'm like, man, that's First Baptist before they moved across town. And so it was just really cool to, to see that, and so um, it's just really neat. But also I like because it was in the 80s, and because it was in the 80s, they played up on all these different like stereotypes of people. But it's not just um, Stranger Things. Most movies or television shows play up or like to polarize certain kind of people, certain characters. Um, just think about the movies that you have watched across your life or TV shows. And I would ask, why is it that the football player or the athlete is always stupid? Why is it the cheerleader is always really friendly with the guys? And why is it the nerd somehow always gets his head stuck in a toilet or a locker? Um, because Hollywood, for whatever reason, has chosen uh, to uh, give in to these stereotypes, even though we all know, um, even though some people totally fall in the stupid or friendly towards the guys or whatever it is category, by and large, those uh, polarizing people or stereotyping or putting this kind of label on someone, most, mostly in life, it's not true. In fact, it's unfair. And if we're really honest in life, um, putting labels on people or trying to group people into a certain thing, it's not only is it unfair, but it's typically it's unkind. And as, a, as, a, as, I, as I thought about this series and I thought about as a Christ follower myself, that the Lord has just said over and over to me that I don't need to get into the habit of placing labels on people good or bad, that everybody is different, that people change, and to group someone in and place a label on them, especially before I get a chance to know them, is far, is, is far from kind and is far from the heartbeat of God. But what I want to ask is, what about when you or I 
is the person that's getting the label put on. What, what, what does it feel like when you're the one that you're feeling like you're getting labeled? And I think this is where the tension lies for all of us. Because some of us, it's not that someone's putting a label. If we're really honest, there are, there are people in this room, including myself at times, we put a label on ourselves that we view in a negative light for whatever reason. And what I would say is, and this should be on the screen, but if we're, if we're not careful, we will let how people label us or how we label ourselves determine and define our lives. I mean, how many of us know, like, we have allowed a label? I mean, how many ex-pro athletes spiral out of control? We see them come back out of retirement because once that label is peeled back off, they don't know how to cope with reality. How many people that all their life in a small town, like they were the, the king, they were the homecoming queen, they were the prom queen, and then they move off to school and they become a social security number. And when that label is pulled off, they don't know how to deal with life. And so we begin to look to all these different things. Because all of us, if we're really honest, know someone that has let a label placed on them define their very existence. Or maybe you're here today and you have simply placed a label on yourself and you have chosen to believe lies of the enemy. And I, I thought, why would we talk about this? And I just thought, man, because this is something as I interact with the people of this body, the church, it's just a constant reminder that we struggle with how we see ourselves. We struggle with things that have been said to us as a child. We struggle with so many issues that stem from unfair labels that we place on ourselves or have been placed on us. And what happens is if we're not careful, these labels begin to put limits on our life. And begin to put limits on the things that we can do. And if that's your story, I'm, what I've been praying all week is that you would experience breakthrough. That you would be to, able to peel off some of those labels or realize that those labels are not bad. And that they would become a badge of honor. That you would stop let negative thinking define your life. And on the flip side, this should be a warning to all of us in the room that our words carry weight. This would be a, 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 a extreme warning to me as a father, which I have not always got right. I've said things to my kids that are hurtful that you can't take back. But it should be a reminder to all of us that we need to be careful with our words because if we're not careful, we can place labels on people's lives that extremely limit them and hold them back. But the truth of the matter is, is labels aren't a new thing. Labels have been something we've been struggling with and dealing with since the beginning of mankind, if we're honest. And this morning, we're going to talk about an individual. And over the next four weeks, we're going to talk about an individual who knew all about labels. So if you have your Bibles or you have your smartphones, you can turn with me to the book of Exodus. If you're new to church, uh, the book of Exodus is in the Old Testament. That means it's on the right. It's the beginning of the Bible. It, uh, Exodus is the second book in the Bible. And so you can turn there. We're going to be in chapter 2. If not, we'll have the words on the screen. But we're going to be looking at uh, the labels that Moses dealt with in life. And so for the four, next four weeks, we're going to be talking about Moses. We're going to be looking at his life and the scene. To give you a little background of what's going on um, leading up to this. So uh, Israel, Jacob, Israel becomes a nation. He has, all the, he has 12 sons. Um, and so at one point, his son Joseph, uh, they acted like he was dead and he'd been thrown in a ditch and was sold off. Well, ultimately, Joseph, if you know anything about the Bible, he ends up being the second in command. This is a whole other sermon for another day. He's the second in command of all of Egypt. Well, Canaan, there's a famine going on. And so Israel comes with his sons and Joseph receives them and says, you can bring all of your livestock, your family, I forgive you guys, and you can come into the land of Egypt. 
The people of Israel, the Hebrew people, did very well. At the time of the story we're going to pick up, this family of 12 boys now is about, they they think, 600, they estimate there was up to 600,000 men. And if you add in women and children, there are like 2 million Israelites, Hebrew people. So they have definitely done what the Lord said. He has made Abraham's descendants into a great nation. They are flourishing. But at this time now, we have a Pharaoh, and he knows nothing of Joseph. And what do we say about most leaders? What do they want to do? They want to be in charge. And so like a lot of leaders we know, this leader is very prideful, and he operates out of fear. Any of us that have ever worked or served under anyone that operates out of fear, you know it is not fun. Because people that operate out of fear make very irrational decisions. And what does this this leader do? Pharaoh says, from this point on, he's like, man, these Hebrew people are going to outnumber us. We've got to stop this. They're going to overthrow us. So he issues a law that says, if you have a son, if you're a Hebrew, if you're Israelite, if you have a, 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 a newborn son, you're to take your son down to the Nile and throw him in and let him drown to be killed. So at that time, the worst label you could have possibly put on your life was to be a newborn Hebrew boy. And that's exactly where we're going to pick up today in Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. It says, Now a man from the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child... She hid him for three months. But when she, could no, when she could hide him no longer, she got him, no, she got a, a papyrus basket for him. And she coated it with tar and pitch. And she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. So we stop right here just for a second, just kind of get a picture of what's going on. There's several things that just stand out to us. Several things that stood out to me. For starters, We see a family that refuses to give in to this label that has been put on a male child. We see a family that says, no more, we're not doing this. It speaks of a mother's love for her son, for her child. But it also is not just the love of the mother. This is a family affair. This is a whole family having the courage to push past a label that's been handed down by Pharaoh, the person who has the authority and the power to take their life. It said any newborn son must die, and they're like, not happening on our watch. But what's so incredible here is not only did they have um, this incredible faith at the beginning, the, the more the story unfolds, you begin to see just how much their faith continues to grow. Because it wasn't like they just... Um, Kept him hidden. What does it say? It says that after this boy is three months old, what do they do? They put this boy in a basket and turn him loose. You know what? She did exactly what he said at that moment. She took him down to the Nile. But instead of letting him drown, she places him in this papyrus little um, basket. Yes, thank you. ADHD. Basket. And interestingly enough, that I, while I was studying this week, I learned something I'd never known before. The Hebrew word for papyrus basket is only used one other place in the Bible. And that Hebrew word is used to describe the ark from Noah. And interestingly, the same ark, this, this papyrus basket, this ark, this, this little basket, stood to provide deliverance for this child, just like the ark did for Noah and his whole family. And we completely see this in the verses to come. In verse 4, it says his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. And then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe. And her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw a basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. And then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. 
So the girl went and got the baby's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So this woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. When I, I read this, I, I just, I'm just going, man, this is incredible. Like, I, I, like, I'm, I've, we hear these stories, I've read these stories over and over. But no matter how many times I've read them, they're just incredible to me, especially as I get older and have kids of my own. I'm like, are you kidding me? But what just blows my mind for starters, God is softening the heart of Pharaoh's daughter. You're like, how do you know that? Well, she found this baby. What did she say it was? This is one of the Hebrew babies. Newsflash, she knows what that means. She knows that carries a label of death. But what does God do? God uses the tears and the crying of a three-month-old baby boy to soften the Pharaoh's heart for her to feel sorry for him. So much so that she would want to take him as her own. It could have been so easy. But what's also incredible is that we see this baby boy's sister is following along. We don't know if like this baby's mom, we don't know if Moses' mom says, hey, follow along behind. But we see this daughter, we see Miriam, she's following behind, watching. And as she sees Pharaoh's daughter look at this basket and see her son, she has the strength and the courage to approach Pharaoh's daughter and say, do you want me to go get a Hebrew woman that can nurse this child? Now, it doesn't say this, but common sense would say, basket what comes up with baby and as soon as i open it a woman comes up to me saying hey i can go get someone to nurse it um uh, you probably put this back in the basket and yes you probably know who the mom is but that's not what happens what happens she's like absolutely why because her heart has been open why because the Lord used this crying baby to open her heart and blind her heart for her to begin to have compassion and love for this child and to push past this label that was placed on him. And she says, yes, go get someone. In that moment, the Lord completely rewards the faith of this family. And can you imagine the joy that this family had from following and trusting the Lord, particularly the mom. I mean, can you imagine how much their faith had been strengthened in that moment? Can you imagine moms nursing your child for three months and then putting them in a river just hoping something good's going to come of it? But in that moment, they realize that all the hiding and all the pain and, and fear of trusting the Lord to trust their child and trust into the Lord's hands in that water that he rewards. And not only did, did God spare Moses' life, but he allowed his mom to raise him at the beginning of his life. When she says, go and nurse him and I'll pay you, oh, that's like icing on the cake. But it's not like in America where you, like, you nurse your kid for like six weeks or six months if you're really lucky. And maybe you're weird in America if you nurse your kid for a year. Like you nurse your kid then three to four years easily. That's just what they did. And it seems weird to us in our culture, that's just gross, like he's crawling up in her lap, you know, but that was like their culture. And to have all the money and all the stuff that we have today. So this, what does that mean? It means this boy grew up in this Hebrew home, this God-fearing, God-loving, God-trusting home. And what do you think Moses grew up in those first three to four years hearing about Yahweh? 
about the Lord, about how he loved them. And how he had a special plan for Moses' life. And once the boy was weaned, once Moses was weaned, he was given back to Pharaoh's daughter where he could be told, where, where I love this, he says, where he became her son. Just didn't become some like pet project. He became her son. And in the moment where Pharaoh's daughter picked up that baby boy, in the moment God began to work in her heart and she had compassion on him. If there was any doubt of what was going on in this moment, there is no doubt. He becomes her son. He went from having the worst curse and the worst label you could have on your life, death, to becoming royalty, to becoming adopted as a part of this family. And if that's not a picture of the gospel, I don't know what is. And, and, and beyond that, we have to see what God's doing here. God is raising up a leader that will one day lead his people out of Egypt and out of slavery and out of bondage. He is raising up a boy because he is now going to get his royalty. He is going to get the finest education you can get in that day. He is going, there is nothing he is going to go without. He is going to have the best training in every area of life. And what God is doing is God is saying, you are going to lead, you're going to, you're, you're going to, he's raising up a boy that is going to do what his name implies. And what does his name imply? He was drawn out of the water. And in the same way, God is about to use him down the road to draw out the Lord's people out of slavery and out of bondage and out of fear. Pharaoh thought by killing all the newborn males, would prevent the Hebrew people from one day overthrowing his kingdom. What I love is he was unaware how his prideful decision would be the very thing that brought a little boy into his house that would be trained and that would have to take everything from him. And what I'm just reminded of is like, man... What we read in our E3 today in Proverbs, there is a way that seems right to man, but at the end it leads to death. And if the Lord is for something, there is no stopping what he has set into motion. And what I've been praying, and what I'm praying for you this morning, is that you would see that God is bigger than any label that you have placed on yourself. Or maybe a label someone else has placed on you. And I've been praying this week for some of you that God would open your eyes this morning to this reality. That God has you right where he wants you. And maybe it is this, this season and this label that you can't stand is the one thing that God is using to prepare you for something down the road. But as long as you see that label as something negative, you will never begin to experience the fruit it's trying to produce in your life. For your own sake and for the sake of those around you and for the gospel. I mean, let's just take this example for like, if you're older, single, being single. When you, when you hit a certain age, you're like, no one wants to be single. And then being single was hard, especially if you're a godly person, because the world doesn't honor things. Everybody wants one thing or another, and it seems like everyone that's not, uh, that is like somewhat normal, is married or with someone. And so what do we do is we take this label of single, which could be a good thing. It could be a season of refining and God doing something special in our hearts. And what do we do? We take this label and we place it on single. And it's like we draw this diagram that says, because I'm single, I'm ugly. Because I'm single, there's something wrong with me. I'm jacked up. I'm damaged. I'm, I'm broken. I'm unlovable. And we just begin to add all these layers of labels that are so false. Maybe we, we had something crazy happen. Maybe we went through a bad divorce. We didn't have anything to do with it. We tried everything in our power to make it work. 
So we have this label that says divorce, and, and with that, man, it comes with this label that says baggage. And like, man, no one wants, I got three kids, who in the world wants to be with me? And we just start adding these labels. Sometimes we add labels that we think are good. I'm the boss, I'm in charge. And because of the way we conduct ourselves, other people want to walk up and put labels. Egotistic, prideful, narcissistic, ridiculous to work for. Do you see how, how this plays out in life? And what happens is when we give in to these negative labels, we allow these labels to dictate us and just begin to be something that so thwarts anything positive in our life. I mean, some of you are here today, you've experienced a label, just like Moses, it, was, it had nothing to do with it because of the color of your skin. You've dealt with labels put on you all your life. It, to me, it was a little different moving here. Like, I grew up in the South, and so, like, um, and then when I, we moved to Mississippi, and we went to the Civil Rights uh, thing, I mean, I, I, like, I cried when I was in that. It's like, man, these are like my parents' age people that were doing all this stuff. This is horrific. We're hanging people like a few years before I was born. Hanging people in America because of the color of their skin. I listened to this one thing. They, they convicted these guys that raped and killed this person or did something that was terrific. They, they killed this boy because they thought he whistled at him. And I remember, like, this was a testimony. The, the, the attorney that was like, the defense attorney looked at them and looked at the jury and says, your grandparents would roll over in their graves if you convict this man. And I thought, what in the world? Like, what country are you living in? But this was just like, one generation removed. And we still face issues with that today. One of the things I loved being a student pastor is I felt like growing up, especially in here, I can only speak for the kids I worked with, is like, man, kids just didn't see color. Anything like the people I grew up with. And it just that, if there's anything, I was like, oh, we're finally winning in an area. I was like, this is an area we're winning in. But if we're honest, I mean, how many of us, if, I mean, and, and I don't even understand and relate. I mean, I laughed, I laughed. There was a, there was a funny video. It was way too long to show, show. I was like, if you made it like half that, I would have played it. It was about, it was this funny video about being white. And it was like all this stuff about being Caucasian and stuff. It's like only white people would spend $1,500 on a dog. And I'm just laughing because there's so many stereotypes typical things play out. But I'm like, this is, these labels aren't true. This isn't about white people. This is about rich white people. I'm not buying no $1,500 dog. I have a cat. It's never been to the vet unless it's one of those things at Walgreens that we, because my wife finally talked us into letting it get a shot. I'm like, it's a cat. It's going to be fine. If it needs something, it will claw you and, you know. I'm like, what? But is this not the world we live in? I, I mean, honestly, when I go places, like, I, 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 I cringe when someone introduces me as their pastor at times. I, I looked at my buddy. I love him. Casey from New Orleans. I said, buddy, stop introducing me as your pastor. Introduce me as your friend. We are friends. Because the moment you introduce me as pastor, it just gets weird in here. Everyone's like, oh, praise God. Oh, <laughs> Pastor I, Pastor, I just cussed. Can you please pray for me? I feel like I'm going to hell. You know, it's like, what in the world? I'll never forget when Ebby started going to fitness lab a long time ago. It was like way back in the day when they were first starting. It was all soccer moms. And she started going. And like no one in the gym knew she was a pastor's wife. She's like, I love this. She's like, I have friends, Brent. Because being a pastor's wife sucks at times. Because people are weird. They haven't been here because a lot of you have never gone to church. But there's just like expectations of like, she's going to be a certain way. If I say something, she's going to cringe. And it was like, and then when I came, people were like, they found out I was a pastor's wife. Then they looked at her like, you're a pastor's wife? She's like, yeah. What? I'm like, she's like, yeah, we're normal. We're humans. Yeah. And I'm like, yes. But those, I'm, I, I hate that label because that label has been so tainted in our own country, that people don't open up and let me into their life because they think I'm going to judge them or be weird.
But I've just said, you know what? I'm not going to allow those labels to define me. I'm going to push past the awkwardness of them going, oh gosh, he's going to probably judge me. To go, man, he is a human being who loves people. And he's okay with me being not okay. And what I just would say to us is this. Is despite those labels, despite that negative thinking in your mind, you need to know that despite those labels, how you make you feel, you're not limited by those labels. And that's the bottom line this morning. Is that God is not limited by any label in life. He's not. The thing that you think that he can't overcome is the very thing he will show off. I mean, for me, I had Michelle write because I terribly write. But I mean, for me, I struggle with insecurity. Not near as much as I used to. But early on, it was horrible. And you can ask my wife, because I was miserable to live with, because like I had to be always the one in the spotlight and dominate and to do, and I was squishing the life out of this strong, beautiful woman who felt like, man, she was losing herself. And it took counseling for a year and a half for me to, to like work through a lot of this. And it all stemmed from what? Because insecurity comes from something. It came from me feeling stupid growing up with a kid with a learning disability. I hated school. I felt so dumb. I hated reading in front of people. I mean, that was the worst part about growing up going to church. It's like they would go around... Man, I like, I think these people should be beat. I know they didn't mean anything, but it's like, we're going to go around and read out of the Old Testament today. And, and they come around to me, and I'm like, Ugh. I don't know this word. I've got to go to the bathroom. You know, it's like, what in the world? You know, but it was terrifying for me. I would like pray, Lord, please let me not have to read. But what does God do now? I read in front of people every week. What do I do? I get up and speak all the time. Why? Because it's not about me. God knew that I was not stupid. But God gave me a thorn in my flesh so that I would be able to empathize with people. So that he would remind me on a daily basis of my brokenness. That I don't need to be insecure. I need to be confident in who the Lord has said I am. If God could use me, that's what I love working with teens. Like, if God can use me, he can definitely use you. And that was why it made us want to plant a church. It's like, man, there's so many adults in our community that live with these labels on them. Or believe lies about the church. They have put a label on the church because the church has just been known for ridiculous things. And we choose to walk in the freedom that these labels bring, the possibilities of what God can do in and through us is limitless. It's limitless. It's incredible. It's the reason, and the reason these possibilities in your life become limitless is because you finally have stopped letting yourself be consumed with negative thinking. So tomorrow, what would happen if you chose to walk in the freedom of these labels? Here's what you need to know. There would be no limits to who you could become a friend to. There would be no le limits to who you could serve in your school this fall, in your home, in your work, or the people in your community. The possibilities would be limitless. And sadly, I am convinced that the church far often has placed labels on certain individuals in our society just because they don't look like us, they don't think like us, they don't act like us. And as a result, those labels have served as a barrier to the gospel. And I'm convinced this breaks the heart of God. I'm not saying we change truth. Truth will always be truth. I love what this pastor said. He preached at Pine Lake this last week. I watched. He goes, man, the, he goes, the worst thing, I forget the scripture he read, but he was like, he goes, this is social media. He goes, man, where we just blat out our opinion and we don't stay around for a conversation. We can just put out whatever we want, hateful, and not stick around for a conversation, but that, that doesn't anyone any good. But, but what I would say to us is this, is to go, man, just because you listen to someone doesn't mean you agree with them. It means you are loving and want to hear their opinion. No more than just because you disagree with them doesn't mean 
that you don't love them. You just simply disagree with them. I have a lot of friends, and they live lifestyles very different than mine. And I don't agree with some of the choices they make. But I love them as people. They are a person to be loved, not a person to be fixed. That's the Lord's job. And I'm going to change what God's standard is. But I have just been wrestling with this over and over in my mind, asking God, God, how can I be, get better and better at engaging people that have that believe things that are different than me, that look differently than me, or engaged in lifestyles that I clearly disagree with? How can I begin to have conversations that ultimately bring them face to face with the gospel in a loving way? That is our role as the church. It is to step into darkness and, and lovingly bring people out into freedom. I, I, I was hearing a statistic the other day. 5% of our, our, our people that die, die by committing suicide. That's just sad. And I just go, man, we're surrounded by people that look like they have everything. And let's be honest, we live in a very affluent town. We live in a town where people have all kinds of stuff, but they do not have the one thing they absolutely need. And that is a life-giving relationship with Jesus. And they just keep adding labels that they think will just make them happy. And it just... Only to figure out that that label it will leave them just as empty as the one they got before. And maybe that's your story. So as we end our time, I just want to ask a question. What is the label that's been holding you back? I, I've been honest to say, hey, I struggle with insecurity. I struggle with wanting people wanting to like me. That was good. That was a good message, Pastor. I, you know, I want people to like me, but I've realized, man, I, I, at the end of the day, I've come to the point like, man, whether you like it or not, I could care less. I mean, I probably do care, but I don't care like I, like I try to die to that. I, I want to, at the end of the day, go, man, God, I want to honor you and honor your word and love people well. And when I do that, I'm not insecure. And I, when I realize, you know what, I might not be the smartest guy. I'm not going to be able to parse the Greek and do all that stuff. But you know what? That, that's not who God's called me to be. He's called me to be a person to reach everyday people. And so I'm glad we have guys that can do all that. Because then I read their notes and learn. Like I learned, you know, this week, the same Hebrew word. I'm glad someone, that's, their, that's the way God's wired them. He's not wired me that way. But I want to be who he's called me to be. So what if you let that label? It could be a label that you've allowed someone to put on you. It could be a label that you've placed on yourself. Self. And sadly, and myself could be thrown in this, it's a label that you've placed on someone else. Maybe it's you don't struggle with some labels, but man, you just struggle being judgmental and putting labels on people that just serve as a barrier to the gospel. And I just want to ask us, will we have the courage to give those labels to the Lord? I mean, what God wants to do is he wants to peel those labels off. He wants to peel off those labels in a negative tone and do something new. And what he wants you to do is he wants to begin to give you a new label. What does that label say? That you're loved unconditionally, jacked up mess and all, as is. Like, you know, when you go to dirt cheap in town, man, you have to, it's like, anybody go there? It's like, man, it's like, dude, it is a mess in there. But every once in a while, you'll find something good. I found a vision skateboard from like back in the day for $8. It was totally awesome. But like, man, you're around some just crazy people sometimes in there. You're like, man, what in the world? And, but when you buy it, it's as is. So sometimes you're going to get a dud. But God, he looks at us and he goes, there is no dud. I want to buy you as is. So in front of your seat, you're going to find a piece of paper just like this in the front of your seat. So there's like a pocket right in front of you for all of you. I want you to take that out. It should be also a pen in your seat. And what I want to do is I just want to take a few moments and I want us to do this. On that piece of paper, 
You know, don't be looking at your spouse. Don't be looking at your friend. This is between you and the Lord. I want you to really write this out. I want you to write a label on the top one. I want you to write a label, man, you struggle with. A label that's been placed on you by someone. A label that you've placed on yourself. Maybe it's a judgmental heart, man, you've placed, uh, you know, on someone else. They're too far gone or whatever it, it is. I want you to write that label down. And on the label on the bottom... What I want you to do on that is I want you to write something that the Lord is speaking into your heart this morning. Something that he's spoken into you or something that you, maybe you don't even hear it. Maybe you're just in a really bad spot and you just need to write on there, I'm loved by the king. I'm his son. I'm his daughter. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ. Maybe you've never come into a relationship and I'm talking about going to church. I, I went to church my whole life, but at 23, I realized there was a difference between going to church and having a life-giving relationship with Jesus. And at 23, I said, God, I want come, you to come in and be the Lord of my life, to be the boss. And at that moment, I knew he took this insecure kid who felt stupid and he put a new label on my heart that says, rescued, redeemed, love, cherished, more than a conqueror and maybe today for you that's simply what you need to do god just needs to put a put a, a label on you that says you're his and if that's you man I, all you have to do is say look you recognize one that you're a sinner we've all sinned we've all fallen short of the glory of god but to say god despite my brokenness you made a way back to yourself through your son, Jesus Christ. And so God, I wanna place my faith and trust in what you did on the cross and what you did in conquering the, 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 all that when you resurrected yourself from the grave. Jesus, would you come in? Would you save me? You don't have to know all the things. That's you today. I just wanna ask you, come find me afterwards. Come find someone and allow the, the Lord to work. But I want us to do the two things. I want you on the top one, I want you to write. What is the label you struggle with? And on the bottom, I want you to write a truth. And what I want to ask some of you, you don't have to all do this. You don't want to have to do this. But I, 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 one of the things that we said when we came here, I want there to be freedom in the room. I don't want like, oh gosh, if I respond, they're going to think my marriage. Who gives a rip, man? I'm like, dude, if you can't be jacked up and okay, be okay with that, then man, there's something wrong with us. Like there needs to be freedom in the room to respond. And for some of you, you've been carrying, like for me, this is like a real deal. Like insecurity, I, I told a couple yesterday we, we met with to kind of start mentoring them. I said, man, the first like six sessions of counseling, I just wanted to lay in the floor, suck my thumb in the fetal position. It was terrible. Because I'd let my insecurity hurt my wife so bad. And I'm like, man, talking about love, I'm like, you put up with me for all those years? Man, you, you're gonna walk around in heaven like you haven't had a V8, you gotta have a crown so big. And, and what I would say to some of you is go, man, that thing that's been hurt, I'm just going to ask, man, if you just tear that thing off, peel it, if you, you don't have to, tear it up. Maybe you just need to get out of your seat in a minute, and we'll give you a second to write, but in a minute, Robin's going to lead us in a song. And I love, he says, man, you are my greatest reward, just to be known and just to be known and to be loved by you. And he loves you as is. And I just want to say, man, like what I do, I'm, I start us off. I just go, man, you know what? I'm not stupid and I'm not insecure. God says, I'm, he's not placed in me a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of love, and of sound mind. And when I start feeling this way, I'm like, no, not today. I'm not doing this. I'm not going down this road. I know who I am. I'm the child of the king. And so I just lay these at the feet. We don't have an altar. We don't have no cross here. But I'm just laying here at the, the ghetto uh, astroturf for the pellets and say, man, hey, I give this to you, God. Die in the self. And that's you today. It doesn't make you more spiritual if you get up and respond. But for some of you, you just need to. Like the act of doing something, you are, you are saying to the Lord, I am no longer sitting and, and, and going to sit in this, 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 uh, this label. So I just pray, and it's going to take a few moments to arrive. But God, I just pray as, they, as, they, as we think about this. We 
just pray for freedom. God, I thank you all those years ago that Moses' family said, we are not going to let this label determine the fate of our son, of our brother. We are going to choose to lean into the label you've placed on his life. And I pray that over every child, every man, every woman, every person in this room. God, would we experience freedom and joy that come from the labels you place on our life. So God, I just pray, just as a moment, we just have to reflect and write. And then as Robin leads us, God, would you just give us freedom to respond, not that we have to come forward. If they feel led, pray that they would come forward and lay those things at your feet. Not feeling ashamed to hear your voice, what we say at our church all the time. You belong here.